Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship at St. Peter's. We're glad to see all of you here this morning. I do want to call your attention to a couple of announcements. Um, this Thursday is, and I know you guys are tired of me saying this, but this Thursday is our Red Cross blood drive, and I wouldn't keep bringing it up if it wasn't important. But we still have a lot of open slots, so go to redcrossblood.org and sign up for a spot to come in and donate blood this Thursday. Also, this coming Saturday uh, is our week to serve at the Hope Mission Soup Kitchen. Uh, we're doing uh, soup and sandwiches, and we need soup and we need sandwiches. So there is a sign-up sheet in the narthex. We hope that you will feel led to help with this important ministry. So now... Let us turn our hearts. Well, wait, wait, wait. I've got one more announcement. I'm looking over. I didn't mark this up. This coming Saturday is our monthly food drive in the parking lot for Martha's Mission. So please bring your non-perishables out Saturday morning, and that is between 10 and 12. And, you know, all of these things, the blood drive, the soup mission, the, uh, the food drive... All of this is a way that we can reach out into the community and help those who are in need, and that is what we are called to do as followers of Christ. And now let us turn our hearts as we come together to worship him. God, it is good to be in your house on this Lord's Day, to be gathered together with these brothers and sisters in this wonderful family that you have made. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, for his forgiveness makes it possible for us to be with you. And oh, what a joy that is. And we come this morning, Lord, acknowledging that Yes, we have been disobedient. We do turn our backs on you. We can't help it, Lord. 
It's in our nature. Yet You love us enough that You make a way to take away the stain of the sins that we've committed, to remove the guilt from our record, to wash us clean in the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, we can't say enough how grateful we are for that. And in Your presence here this day, Lord, we come acknowledging that there are so many that we know who are hurting right now. We've talked this morning about ways that we can reach out and bring food to the hungry in our community, that we can give the gift of life through a blood donation to help someone who's sick or who's hurting. And Lord, we know that that's just some of the ways that you bring healing to the world through through using us as your servants. And Lord, we know there's so many other ways that you bring healing upon those who are hurting. And so we ask you, Lord, we ask you in compassion and empathy to reach down and bring healing to those who are hurting this day. And now, Lord, help us to not focus on the trials of this life, but to focus instead in this hour on you and your love and your never-ending promise of eternal life through Christ. We pray this in His name. Amen. people here this morning are wearing at least one piece of jewelry of some type? Okay. I have a ring that I wear on this hand. It's a, it's a tiny little gold ring. It's got an S on it. And this was given to me by my grandfather when I turned 10 years old. And the S stands for Stanley. And I had always thought there must be some wonderful story behind this ring. And, um, and I've worn it, I've worn it most of my life because I look at it and it reminds me of my grandfather. And like I said, I thought for a long time there must be some beautiful story behind this ring and how he got it. And I asked him one day when he was really old, I said, tell me the story of this ring. And he said, oh, I was out walking one day and I, I, was, I looked and, and there in the trash can I saw this ring. And so I got it, and it had an S on it, and that was my name. And I thought, that's the story behind the ring. But if you knew my granddad, that, that sounded like the kind of thing he did. But this ring, for me, it's not my granddad, right? It doesn't change my granddad, doesn't change our relationship, but it's a reminder of who he was and what he meant to me. I have another ring that I wear on my other hand. And this ring 
is my wedding band. And what it tells me, it reminds me that I'm married to this person here. But I don't really need a ring to remind me of that, do I? No, but this ring is more than just a ring. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of a promise that I made many years ago to devote my life to this person and to share my life with this person. And when I look at that ring, that's what I think about. It's not this ring that, that makes me keep my promise, but every time I see it, it's a symbol of the promise, right? And this morning in our sermon, we're going to hear about a symbol or a sign that God gave us in the form of a ring, and that is a rainbow. And that was at the end of the great flood when Noah and the animals came off of the ark and God placed a rainbow in the sky as a symbol of a promise that he was making. He said, this is my sign of the covenant that I make with you to never flood the world again. And so, when we see a rainbow in the sky, do we think, oh, God's never going to flood the world again. Isn't that great? No, I don't think that. But I see that, and I think about the beauty of the rainbow. I think about how it happens so naturally, and I think about, you know, God has really created a beautiful world. And I hope that when you see something like that, like a rainbow in the sky, that that's one of the things you think about. Because you know our God is an awesome God. He made a promise and, and made a sign of that promise with a rainbow. And so do we ever have to worry about that promise going wrong? No, we never do. Some people put on wedding bands and they don't keep that promise. But God, when God makes a promise, God keeps His promise. And what's the best promise that God ever made? He promised us eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Does God keep His promises? Yes, He does. And that's a promise that we can all count on. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for who You are. And we thank you for the promises that you make to us. The promise not to destroy, but to give life. And Lord, as we come before you, I know that all of us in our hearts make these promises to you that we're going to obey. We're going to be better. And Lord, we can't do it on our own, but you have promised that you will help us. And so we count on that promise. And we look forward to the fulfillment of the promise that one day we will be with you and we will be with Jesus and we will be singing praises at the foot of his throne. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. Thank you for your promise, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.
Let us pray. Lord, as you have already spoken to us this morning through the words of the songs that we have heard, the songs that have been lifted up to you, we pray now that you will speak to us through your word as it is written aloud. And I pray, Lord, that you'll lay your hands upon your servant and enable me to proclaim all the words you want your people to hear. In Christ's name, amen. Our reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Genesis, the ninth chapter beginning with verse 8 and reading through verse 17. Genesis 9, verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're beginning a sermon series for Lent this morning, and we're beginning it with the ending of a story, a story that many of us first heard as a child, and that is the story of Noah's Ark. And across our nation, across the world, there is many a church nursery that has some sort of depiction of Noah's Ark painted on a wall. It's a wonderful children's story. Children love it. It's this great story about this wonderful man named Noah, and he builds a boat or an ark, and he gets his family on it, and the animals all come two by two. There's even songs about the animals coming two by two, and they all get on the ark. And then there's a flood, and it rains for 40 days, and at the end, Noah sends out a dove, and the dove comes back with an olive branch, and the rainbow appears and everybody lives happily ever after, right? And that's the story that that we tell the children. And when we tell the children, yes, we mention the flood, but we leave out the darkness. We leave out the horror of the real story. Think about this. We live in an area where we have hurricanes, and we have seen the results of flooding. And over the last 10 years, some of the communities further south on the eastern part of our state, they have seen horrendous flooding. Well, this was nothing like that. There was this deluge of floodwaters. Cities were wiped off the face of the earth. Crops and livestock were decimated. Moms drowned. Dads drowned. Children drowned. Even Cute little kittens and puppies disappeared below the waves. I can't fathom the horror of what happened. In chapter 7 of Genesis, it makes it very clear. It says, all life was blotted out. Right now, 
we are in the midst of a worldwide calamity called COVID-19. Almost two and a half million people have died. But yet, 61.7 million have recovered. And that's great for those survivors, isn't it? But in the flood, how many survivors were there? There were four. Everybody else died. Four people survived that disaster. Noah and his family. So much death. But we don't really focus on that when we tell the story to children, do we? No, we don't want it to be a scary story. But it is a scary story. And even as adults, the story can be a little bit problematic because it doesn't fit our image of a loving God. So even when we share the story in sermons and things, it's easier to focus on the good part of the story, the nice part, where everything turns out right in the end. When the first man and the first woman sinned in the Garden of Eden, what did God say to the man? He said, cursed is the ground because of you. Have you ever thought about what that means? Not only was the man condemned, the earth was condemned, the ground was condemned, the dust from which God had created the man the dust into which he had breathed life was now sullied or tainted by sin. And as humankind multiplied, so did sin, until all of creation was defiled. In Genesis chapter 6, leading up to the story of Noah's Ark, we read this, that God looked down and saw that every inclination of the thoughts of humankind was only evil continually. The same creation that God had declared good at the beginning was now anything but good. So what did God do to creation? He decreated it. He decreated it through the flood. God told Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. He's saying, all of creation has been condemned because of what you did. And all of creation paid the price. All of creation suffered because of one act of defiance on the part of one man that opened the world to sin. And so when the flood came, for 40 days the world was consumed by death and destruction. But yet, in mercy, a loving God carried Noah and his family through to the other side, to a new life in a post-flood world. It was like God hit a big reset button. Let's start over. Let's have a new beginning for creation. So think about this. God created everything. And then when the flood came, God decreated everything. And now God recreates everything. And with this recreation comes a promise from God to never again destroy the world with a flood. And as a symbol of this promise, as a sign of this promise, he says, I place my bow in the cloud. And we know that what he's talking about there is the rainbow. Now, when you go back and you look at the original um, Hebrew, we find out something kind of interesting about this word that he uses for bow, that the Scripture uses bow. But let me ask you, when you see a rainbow, do you know what you're seeing from a scientific point of view? There's particles of water in the air and the sunlight hits it and, it and it goes into a prism and we see a rainbow, right? That's the science behind a rainbow. So if that's how it works, 
you need two things. You need the water and you need sunlight, right? And so you cannot have a rainbow without the sun. Am I right? So following this torrential rain that destroyed the earth, what happened? The sun came out. The sun came out again. It was a new day. It was a day of hope. And God showed this by placing this bow in the clouds. Now the Hebrew word for bow is the same word that's used elsewhere in the Old Testament to talk about a bow like a bow and arrow, like a weapon, a weapon of war. And so why was this the word used in Genesis? Well, maybe it's because the shape of the rainbow is curved like the shape of a bow. That could be it. And if you think about a rainbow in terms of, or the word in terms of a weapon, you can see the rainbow is representing God's strength, His might. But here, what we see in the sky is a bow without an arrow. A bow that is not strung to be used as a weapon of war. And we can see this as God saying, I have the power to destroy, but I'm not going to. So this bow in the clouds is not a symbol of war, but of peace. It's a sign that instills fear. I'm sorry, it's a sign that does not instill fear, but instead instills hope. So how, do we, how did we get here? How do we get to this end of this story? How do we go from a story of God's wrath to this beautiful picture of mercy and promise? How do we get from this story of decreation to recreation? Well, in chapter 8, after leaving the ark, Noah makes a sacrifice. He makes a burnt offering to God. And the smell of the smoke reaches up to heaven and the aroma is very sweet to God. Before the flood, when God looked down, all He saw was evil. All God saw was total disregard for God. Now He looks down and what does He see? He sees worship. He sees thankfulness. He sees dedication. He sees that humanity does have some good in them in spite of their sin. The ark with Noah and his family and the animals, it journeyed from the old world that was marked by rebellion to this new world that suddenly marked with worship. Noah worships God in spite of the fact that Noah has just witnessed God's wrath poured out upon the world. Noah saw things that no one should ever have to see. But yet, at the end, what is Noah's attitude towards God? God is good and worthy of praise. Now let's go back for just a minute. Way back in the beginning, God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. And that sin cost creation everything, right? But now God says, I will never curse the ground because of humankind. Or I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from you. So God is up there saying, you know what? Man is just sinful. That's just all there is to it. Always been sinful, always going to be sinful. That's just the way it is. And he's looking down at Noah, who was a man who must therefore be one of these sinful ones. And what is Noah saying? God is good. So, man is forever sinful. God is forever good. The end of this story of Noah's Ark, the end of the flood story marks the start of a new relationship. 
Humanity loves God in spite of the death and destruction that God brought through the flood. God loves humanity in spite of the death and destruction that they have brought through sin. And so at the end of this story, God makes this promise, this wonderful promise marked by a sign in the heavens that it's a new day, it's a new beginning. The end of this story comes with this promise that comes out of a terrible place. The end of the story marks a great reset, a restart, a recreation. We see here a new relationship. God loves us in spite of our sin. God created the world for us. God created life for us. We just have this habit of messing it all up all the time. And God looks down, and you know what God says? He says, what a mess. I imagine he's saying that a lot these days, looking down at the world. What a mess. But then he says, and I am bound and determined to fix it. Consider the depths to which God will go to recreate, no matter what. God looks down on us when we sin and he says, I realize that you are vile and wicked, but still I'm determined. Even though you do the things you do, I am with you, I am for you, this is my promise to you, we will get through this together. I heard something this week I'd never heard before. And uh, this may even show up in a church mice cartoon at some point. But I heard that God loves you so much that if he was in the first grade, he'd take you to show and tell. He would show you off at show and tell. That's how much he loves you. Noah had a lot of time on that boat, didn't he? Imagine it smelled bad. He had a lot of time to think on that boat. On this journey, it's not like the boat went where Noah wanted it to go. No, the boat was driven by the waves of a storm. Noah had a front row seat to the full extent of God's wrath against the world gone astray. He had a lot of time to reflect on his own life. He had a lot of time to think about his relationship with God. Noah had time to think about how he himself could stray and did stray from time to time. And I imagine it was sobering for him. Why would God save me? And at the end of the journey, God said to Noah and to creation, let's start over. Let's begin again. Let's just forget about what happened before and start over. And Noah had a front seat to that too. And God says to him, look up. See that thing up there in the sky? See those beautiful colors stretched across the sky? Anytime you see that, remember this day. Remember my promise. Remember my commitment to you and to all of creation. When you think about it, the story of Noah is the story of Lent. It's a journey that we take from death and destruction to new life. It's 40 days when we get to reflect on our lives, to think about our relationship with God, to think about how we have strayed, how we continue to stray 
It's a time when we can contemplate and claim our sin and accept our guilt. And folks, when you do that, it is sobering. Lent is a journey of clouds, of darkness, of bowed heads, broken spirits, and shame. But at the end of that journey comes Easter. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, just as one man's trespass, and who's he talking about? He's talking about Adam. One man's trespass led to condemnation for all. So one man's act of righteousness, and who's he talking about there? Jesus. One man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the sign of God's love for us. It's the sign of His promise to us of eternal life. Christ died for our sin and He rose to new life to offer new life to us. And this new life marks God's recreation of us. Through the forgiveness of Christ, the wrath that each one of us deserves is replaced with a chance to start over. Our story of death and the destructive power of sin, that story comes to an end. And it's not the ending that we deserve, but it's the ending that God offers through Christ. An ending that is a new beginning where we can look up and proclaim, thanks be to God. I pray that your journey through this Lent may be a journey of hope. I offer you these truths in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. We pray that this has been a blessing for you. And as we think on all that God has done for us, how can we be anything but grateful? You look at Noah, what Noah went through, and when it was all over, what did he do? He offered up a sacrifice to God. He said, thank you, Lord, for your goodness. One of the ways that we thank God is by the giving of His tithes and our offerings. It's a way for us to say, Lord, we thank You for all the blessings that You have given unto me, and in gratitude for You and for all that You've done, I give this back to You. And those tithes and offerings are so important to the work of the church because they help fund all of the ministries of the church. They enable the church to be the beacon on the hill that we're called to be, to make a difference in this world, to help bring this world into the kingdom of God. And so we do thank you for your continued support of the church. Uh, we invite you to place your tithes and offerings in the collection boxes on your way out this morning. And now let me offer a prayer over those offerings. Gracious Lord, we thank you for all that you have indeed blessed us with in this world. And as we now return back to you a portion of the bounty with which you've blessed us, we pray that you will use this to further your kingdom in this world so that all may come to know your promise of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. This we pray in his precious name. Amen. And now go in peace, have courage, do no harm, do all the good you can and stay in love with God. And may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Son Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.